Uh, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Luke, and we're going to start at chapter 10, and then I'm going to end up in the parable of the Good Samaritan. One thing I, I noticed, I have never preached about the Good Samaritan ever. That part of my Bible, my, my, my Bible has no notes. And I'm like, because normally I write my notes in my Bible, so that way I'm like, I'm like ready all the time. I just got to open it. I have never preached on the Good Samaritan, and I, I, I don't know why, but we're going to do it today. Say amen when you're ready to read. We'll start at verse 25, and it says, On one occasion, occasion, an expert of the law, the King James Version says a lawyer, somebody that was an expert, he knew the law inside and out, came to Jesus. Uh, you know, sometimes we overlook little words, but like when, when the Bible says the scribes came to Jesus, if you go back and study what a scribe what did, what a scribe meant, and their status in society, you'll be surprised how those little words change the meaning of the scripture. But it says on one occasion, an expert of the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, and how do you read it? He answered, Jesus actually said, what is written in the law and how do you read it? And then the man answered, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, you have answered correctly, replied Jesus. Do this and you will, you will live. Say that with me. Jesus said, do this and you will live. To love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your body, your mind, and your strength, with everything that's in you, love God. And love God your neighbor as yourself. Now that, you know, and is a conjunction. So I was looking at word because I'm like, I thought there could have been more there, but and meant and. Because if you don't love God, you won't love your neighbor. If you can't love God first, you won't love your neighbor. Sometimes you love God with all your heart and you still can't stand your neighbor. Come on. Amen. He's not my neighbor anymore, so, so it's, it's okay, but... Sometimes, how many know sometimes your neighbor, you know, can, can be crazy? And sometimes we're the crazy neighbor at the same time. But verse 29 is kind of where, where it kind of, it's kind of, check this out. And it says, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, who is my neighbor? Oh, that hit home when I read that this week. Sometimes we want to justify ourselves with scripture. Sometimes I want, see, because we have, we live in a society, which I think is, is, is a detriment that we don't want to really know the truth. We just want our way of thinking you know, collaborated. You know, if you are a Democrat, you will listen to Democrat talking points. If you are a Republican, it will be Republican talking points. Forget what's really true. If you if you are uh, you know a Baptist, you're gonna you're gonna listen to Baptists. If you are Pentecostal, but but when can we get past all this and and we're just trying to justify our viewpoint and our way of thinking? I, I told the story. Some of you probably heard it. I was preaching at a youth camp we had kids in the altars we were crying that they, they were getting saved at the end i went back to the little room and where we were having uh, a supper and a lady caught me and the first thing she said she says brother chad she said do you believe jesus is god or he's the son of god she says my pastor believes that he's god so i looked at her and i smiled and i said i had my bible because i just finished preaching I was about as sweaty as I am now. And I, I said, well, sister, what does this book say? 
Her reply was, I don't know. So because I realized she wouldn't have understood the conversation to get if I would have gotten deeper into uh, what I would like to have told her. And I said, I said, well, when you read it, call me and let me know. We can have a conversation. And I got out of there, took off. He wanted to justify himself. Who is my neighbor? And in verse 30, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, you have to understand the geography of the area. How many times that they went up to Jerusalem and Jerusalem is South Israel, but it's the elevation. Jerusalem is on top of a mountain range. It is way up high. And everybody that went to Jerusalem had to go up into the house of the Lord. And when you would leave Jerusalem, you would go down. And he said he was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. When he was attacked by robbers, this next sentence right here, we forget about it so many times because we just go over. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Why is that so important? They stripped him of his clothes. You see, because in this time, in this part of history, in this region, a person was identified by the clothes that they wore. If you were a priest, you had priestly garments. If you were an Israelite, you had an Israelite garment. If you were a Levite, you had a Levite garment. If you were a leopard, you dressed like a leopard. If you were poor, you dressed like the poor. Well, so what they stripped him of everything that signified who he was, his status in life, and they left him naked. And then a priest happened to be going down the same road. Most of the Levitical priests, a lot of them resided in Jericho, history tells us, and they were coming into, it's about 17 miles away, and they were coming into Jerusalem. And when he saw the man, he passed on the other side. Oh, oh. He kind of does like some of us in Walmart. If you see me in Walmart going like this, just let me go because you're not going to catch me. So too, a Levite. Now, think about this. He, he, he only references two people. He references a priest. Somebody that would offer the sacrifices, that would minister to the people. He was doing his priestly duties in the temple. But then he references a Levite, which the priests were from the, Levit the tribe of Levi and the Levitical priesthood. But the Levite was somebody that worked in the temple that wasn't a priest. They had priestly duties. They would trim the oil. They would do the things of the temple. These two religious men saw this man hurting and bleeding and dying. And a Levite, when he came and saw him, passed by on the other side also. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was and saw him and took pity on him. He went to him he bandages his wounds. He poured on oil and wine. And he put him on his own donkey. And he brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day, he took out two denarii. And he gave them to the innkeeper. And he said, look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you might have. And then Jesus said to the man, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man that fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus replied, go 
and do likewise. What I begin to see here was that one that came down from the house of God was beaten and abused and left. As I'm reading it, I see a picture of Jesus spiritually. He come down from the house of God and he was beaten and, and, and by, by the ones that were there. And then this Samaritan, this half-blood, the one that didn't have a right, accepted him. I want to... Let me, let me break it down just a little more. Jerusalem is of a higher elevation. So every time it says somebody went down, I, I explain that to you. The distance between Jerusalem and Jericho are 17 miles. The road to Jericho during Christ's time had earned the reputation of being dangerous path to take because it was riddled with robbers. In fact, it was dubbed the road was dubbed the way of blood because of the countless blood often shed by robbers. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was winding, meandering, and it was a perfect place for robbers to set up an ambush. And you were warned to never travel alone. The Samaritan, according to historians, the people that lived in Samaria after the northern kingdom of Israel, they were banished from their homeland. I'm getting somewhere. I'm trying to set it up. When the Assyrians captured Israel, they exiled, they exiled most of the Israelites to the land of Assyria, but not all the Israelites were removed. Some of them remained, and the Assyria replaced the Israelites with foreigners. And as a result, the Israelites who remained in the northern part of Israel, intermarried with foreigners. Their sons and their daughters is what became known as the Samaritans. There was a reason Jesus said a Samaritan. They were half-breeds. They were hated. They were despised. The Jews and the Samaritans hated each other. The division between the two groups of people started all the way back to the rebuilding of the temple. Under the leadership of Nehemiah, when the Jews returned to Israel, they refused to include the Samaritans to join them in worship. So the Samaritans created their own worship system by Mount Gershom. Now, that is the reason why, in context... Jesus and the woman at the well said, hey, you, your ancestors worship you on this mountain. He was talking to them specifically. But there's going to come a time when you're going to worship me in spirit and in truth. Because she was a Samaritan. The Jews thought that the Samaritans, the sinners, were spiritually corrupt. Would, would spiritually corrupt the Israelites of the northern kingdom. To make it worse, they were mixed with foreigners and they worshipped foreign gods so jesus said you got these two supposed to be holy religious men and they saw one hurting and they couldn't tell his place in society he was stripped of it we don't know who this man was he might have been a king he might have been a governor he might have been a rich man. He might have been somebody that wasn't very known at all. But Jesus said the two religious men walked on by. But there came a despised one. There came one that was of mixed breed. That said, I will not leave a fellow human being to die. And he began to bandage his wounds and take him to the inn. 
Now, we don't think human beings cruel. Today, in 2023, for there to be a, such a thing as human trafficking, human beings are cruel. Sinful man is cruel. But can we take a few lessons out of the story that Jesus gave of the Good Samaritan? Number one is probably one of my favorite. Love knows no boundaries. Just because you might not be required to love that person, but love them anyway. Come on, uh, do good anyway. See, it wasn't his place because out of the way it implies that this man was probably a Jew, but there was no way to tell. So the religious said, I don't have time for this. I'm about God's work. Don't distract me. I'm going to the temple. I'll be late for the sacrifice because God's more important. The Levite said, oh, I, I, got, I got to go mop the floor in the church. I'm on the cleaning crew. Forget about the man dying. Church that comes to a point where we need to quit looking at celebrities and churches and realize what we're called for, for the hurt and the lost and the dying. Somebody say, love knows no boundaries. The most important lesson we can learn is that love has no limits. You can't simply define your neighbor according to proximity, ethnicity, or cultural background. Jesus taught the importance of loving one another. Number two. My message is that bad. Everybody's falling asleep, really. I'm going to I'm gonna have to jump on you. I'm going to have to put a jump. Number two, listen. <laughs> lesson number two is love knows no end. God's love for us is never ending. And that is the type of love that we should strive for. Love has no end. Number three, love should have the right motivation. I don't love you because you're my child or you're related or we share the same last name. I love you because we are created in the image of God. I mean, when one of my, you know, I always want to get up here and say, good morning, beautiful people. Are you ready to worship God? Because we are beautiful because we are made in the image of almighty God. Love should have the right motivation. Number four is probably the one of the hardest one is, is, is our love for God is a reflection of our love for others. In the discussion of our, with our Savior and the lawyer, we read, he says, you shall love the Lord thy God with all their heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. And he says, then love your neighbor. As yourself. Our love for God is how we reflect others. Lesson number five. Lesson number five. Self-love is not taught in the Bible. I want to say that again. Self-love is not taught in the Bible. We've learned that from commercials. You deserve that new Lexus. You work so hard. We want a thousand dollars of your. I do deserve it. Sandals, a getaway. You deserve. I do deserve. We begin to watch thing and me. I deserve that. I deserve it. I I deserve all these things. But that's not the Bible teaches. Put others first. How we love God is how we love others. If we're selfish towards God, we're going to be selfish towards others. If we're giving towards God, we're going to be giving towards others. Number six, who you are is what you do. Let us focus on the parable for a second of the Good Samaritan. The story is given by Christ. We have seen in this picture Jesus 
three men who saw the dying man, a priest, a Levite, and a Samaritan. But when you look at the list, you would normally expect the priest and the Levite to readily help the victim. In the mind of the Jews, it was unimaginable for, for the Samaritan to be the protagonist of this story. See, we just think, oh, the good Samaritan. What God did is take a, a race that everybody hated. Now Samaritan is a word for helping. Because... The other two did not do their duty. So the Samaritan said, I'll pick up and I'll love when nobody else can. What we don't see is the lawyer being appalled with Jesus. How dare he use a Samaritan? An old dirty Samaritan. Mixed. He's not even pure in his story. We simply see how Christ radically went against the common attitudes of the people of his day. Instead of the priest and the Levite holding the religious position who should have helped the dying man, the least above all was a Samaritan who did something extraordinary. And this tells us that holding a religious position don't make you righteous. Even as a minister, a pastor, a priest, or a church leader, it doesn't mean anything until we are ready to love others. Mm. Three people saw the same dying man, but the Samaritan was the only one who took action. In life, it's not who you are that defines you, but it's what you do. That was Batman. <laughs> it's not it's what you do that defines you. I'm the only one that saw Batman begins. It's not who you are. It doesn't matter where you were born. It doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter if you just got out of Angola two weeks ago. It's what you do now that defines you. Jesus said the past in the past. All things, Paul said, but, but are passed away and all has become new. It's not what you've done, but it's what you do that defines you. You can be the president of our country. You can be the priest in your church. You can be the leader of your group. But without true love, you are nothing. Last is number seven. We must love in action. It's kind of interesting in, in Luke 10 to note that loving God and your neighbor is not a simple declaration in thoughts or words, but it needs action. Loving God and others is an active role to play for us as Christians. It's not a feel-good, fuzzy feeling that stays in your heart. Jesus said to love the Lord thy God heart, soul, strength in your mind. And if you do this, you will live. When we understand that we should love Jesus 100% of our being, and that includes not just thinking and talking, but also our actions. We need to live the words of Jesus out loud. Go be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Somebody say love in action. As we get ready to close, I wonder if there's any times where I've been that priest and just walked on by because I'm busy. I heard a story the other day, and I'll keep the names, and uh, somebody was talking about this very well-known pastor 
And uh, one of my favorites, I listen to him a lot. I get a lot of encouragement from him. <clears throat> and the guy was grew up under this pastor's ministry and now pastors another church. And he said the, the, they were dedicating their new church. And he said, I had the big name pastors. The who's who of TBN was there. But this pastor, that's wrote countless books, preached everywhere, said, hold on, I'll be there in a second. And he went out to the congregation and began to shake random people's hands. So this guy said, I kept trying to get pastor into the room, into the, the hospitality suite where all the, the goodies was and, and all, the, all the, the drinks. And, and he says, but he one-on-one, -on -one, he began to look in people's eyes and encourage them. And then he said, he never made it to those preachers. He stayed there until it was time for service. Random people that he says, I'm going to give of myself to encourage them today. Wow, that hit home. I started thinking about, because we just see pictures, drawings of the Good Samaritan. But I'm pretty sure when the Good Samaritan arrived, I like the way that he was named. Jesus says it didn't matter who his name was. It's what he did that defined him. And I'm sure he grabbed him. Are you okay? Are you okay? Are you hurting? Can you feel your legs? Are you breathing? And as he began to bandage his womb, I can hear the encouragement. You're going to be okay. I'm not going to let you go. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here. I, 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 I know you fell on some hard times. I, I, this is going to kind of hurt, but I'm going to kind of move you. Let, let's, let, 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 let's try to straighten you out. And when he got him bandaged up, and it's going to be okay, brother. Hey, guess what? I'm not going to leave you. I'm here. I'm here. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure that you are right. And he picked him up, and then he went to the end. And if you notice, he didn't leave him there right away. He took care of him all night. And I can see that good Samaritan on a chair and that nameless man that nobody knew who he was. He had no identification that nobody knew. He was just there and, and he was all bandaged. And I can see that Samaritan saying, it's going to be okay. I'm right here if you need anything. And he began to move and he grabbed water and, and he would give him water. And he was doing nothing but encouraging because why because his love for this man that he didn't even know his name never saw there was something in this man and i believe it was a true story more than a parable and i believe jesus was saying what really happened because there are people that's going to love despite who and who you are and maybe somewhere he realized that he was a jew and said i'm going to love him anyway i'm going to be with you anyway and can the church do that in this modern day. I'm going to love you anyway. One thing I learned from the story is that prejudice was there too. See, prejudice is something that's, that's, that's taught because you can get two babies. <clears throat> they love one another, hug one another despite their color. But when we get older, but every once in a while, you're going to find somebody that say, I refuse <clears throat> to be put in a box. I refuse and that, 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 that's me. I refuse for Praise Church to be put in a box. See, I refuse to be called a white church, a black church, 
an Asian, whatever. We are the church of God. Amen. And I refuse to live my life the way others think that I should because I want to do the will of God. And what Jesus didn't say, what Jesus didn't say is that's what I would have done. I would have taken care of his wounds. I would have given everything that he was okay because that's where Jesus was going. He was going to give his life. He was given everything for the ones that walked on by. So I encourage you today. <laughs> I encourage you today as I read the last line. Who is, was his neighbor to the man that fell on robbers? Can I interject this real quick? There's still people that fall on robbers. Well, oh, robber, the thief comes to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus says, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus says, the one who fell on robbers, and Jesus told him, The expert replied, the one who had mercy on him. He looked at the man and he had mercy. How many wish that sometimes people would have a little more mercy? Old Brother Tipton has passed and every time he would get a speeding ticket, he would ask the cop, I'm going to do my impression of Brother Tipton. He was big tall. Can you show me some mercy? <laughs> and I said, well, how did that work? He says, works every time. <laughs> <laughs> so then his son was telling me the story. He says, all I remember is the cop's lights, and, and I popped my head up, and I heard my dad say, can you show me some mercy? <laughs> uh, I tried it. It don't work for me. Can we be a little more merciful? Can I leave you with one scripture that's not going to pop up on the screen? Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I want to read a couple scriptures about your neighbor really quick. The first one is Philippians 2, 3 and 4. Do nothing without selfish ambition or vain conceit, but rather in humility, value others above yourself. Looking unto your own, not looking unto your own interests, but each other. Each of you inner, enters for others, into whatever that says on the screen. I can't say. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests. Inter My homeschool education is coming. <laughs> The entrance of others. So you should be looking out for your brothers. Worship team, come up, please. First Peter 3 and 8, it says, Finally, all of you be like-minded. Be sympathetic to one another. Be compassionate and be humble. Ephesians 4, 25 says, Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. Proverbs 3 and 28, it says, Don't say to your neighbor, come back tomorrow and I'll give it to you. When you already have it with you. Do not plot, plot harm against your neighbor who lives trustfully near you. Romans 15, each of us should please our neighbor's for their good, to build them up. Matthew 19, Jesus said, honor your father and your mother and love your neighbor as yourself. John 15, 12, and I'll end there. My command is this, love each other as I. 